Hello and welcome back to this uh, series of videos on modelling credit risk. Um, so far we've done GLMs and we've done discriminant analysis, which I think are both reasonably straightforward. Um, the maths is pretty well established for both of them and is um, decades, century old in some cases. So, you know, it's, it's well trodden and could be done a long time ago even without using computers. The same is not true of the stuff that we're moving on to, though, which does get a little bit more complex. I'm going to start breaking these videos up a bit. And the first one I'm going to be looking at is K nearest neighbor, which is really interesting, really useful. It's non parametric because what it's trying to do is rather than use something where you apply coefficients to particular. Um, uh, information that you have is trying to just give you a decision um, but it's it's very interesting and widely used and and useful um, just maybe takes a little bit more understanding than some of the methods that we've we've looked at so far so k nearest neighbor um, the rationale behind it what we're trying to do is we're trying to find out what a firm is like and the theory behind it is that you can judge a firm by the firms that it resembles. And by resembles we mean is similar to in terms of various financial measures. In the context of credit risk, what you're saying is, are the closest firms solvent or insolvent? If you had firms like this, did they go bust or did they not go bust? The challenge here is, you know, what do we mean by closest? And that's really the heart of KNN is trying to define what closeness means. Now, if you've only got one measure that you're looking at, say profitability, it's straightforward. You just need to consider the average variable of the new firm, the average profitability of the new firm, and see is it close to the average profitability of solvent firms or insolvent firms. Um, and if that's all there was to it, then it'd be a very short video indeed. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because you're often looking at more than one variable. So if you do have more than one variable, how do you deal with this? What, what does closeness mean in that context? In two dimensions, there's a number of ways that you could think about it. And then there's quite a few basic possibilities. Um, one is called uh, Manhattan distance. Um, so if you've got, um, say, three blocks across and two blocks up, so, or more generally, A across and B up, then the distance between those two is A plus B. It's named after the distance that you need to travel around uh, Manhattan. As you know, Manhattan's built on a grid system, very tall buildings. If you want to get from one place to another, you need to walk uh, across uh, some streets and up some others to, to get to your destination. So the Manhattan distance is simply A plus B. The Euclidean distance, you know, if you are, uh, instead of being a person, you are a bird or a helicopter pilot, uh, and you don't need to worry about uh, the buildings in the way, then you can use Euclidean distance, which is just a squared plus b squared square rooted. So this is based on or equivalent to Pythagoras theorem in two dimensions. And you can see here we have a triangle. And if your two sides are a and b, then the hypotenuse uh, is clearly defined by the square root of a squared plus b squared. More generally, there is something called Minkowski distance, which is um, in two dimensions, uh, a to the k plus b to the k, and then you sum these and you take the kth root. Now, if um, k is equal to um, 1, then what you've essentially got is the Manhattan distance. If k is equal to 2, you have the Euclidean distance. You can take it to higher levels. The, the, the the relevance or the effect of using higher numbers, higher values of k um, for the Minkowski distance is it gives a greater weight to the numbers that are further away, to the observations that are further away, if you're looking at it in a KNN point of view. Um, but for KNN, of all of these, uh, the Euclidean distance is going to be uh, the, the, the most relevant. And in a lot of the uh, code which people have written up for KNN, Euclidean is, is typically the default measure of, of distance. 
So you include the interstellar star states, the most logical starting point. And it's easy to expand to n-dimensional space. So two dimensions, it's the square root of a squared plus b squared. For three, which I've just about drawn a diagram for, is a squared plus b squared plus c squared. It gives you that, that distance in three dimensions. And you can generalize it to n dimensions. That um, So for, for three, you take the square root, of course. So for n dimensions, it's um, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus all the way up to xn squared. Some the more, take the nth root. That gives you the Euclidean distance across n dimensions, which sounds like a sensible way of, of measuring distance. Now, if you're talking about, say, m firms with n financial measures, um, it, it can get quite tiring writing all that kind of stuff out longhand. So let's say you've got firm uh, XM, and the measures for firm XM are XM1, XM2, all the way up to XMN. You could say that the measures that you've got for XM can be described by a vector instead, which is just XM in bold. And if you've got a new firm, Y, which has a vector of measures Y, so that's uh, Y1, Y2, all the way to Yn, but bold y is the vector of those measures, then the Euclidean distance between y and xm is y, the vector y minus the vector xm, and then the norm of that. So what do we mean by the norm? Well, the norm is equivalent to the dot product. So the, the vector you get from subtracting xm from y, if you take the dot product of that times itself, you're taking each of the elements and you are multiplying them by uh, the other. So you're taking uh, y minus y1 minus xm1 multiplied by y1 minus xm1 within that. And you do that for all the different parts of that vector. And then you take the square root of the result. You could also express it in terms of um, vectors multiplied by each other. So y minus xm transposed, so you turn it into a vector which goes across multiplied by the vector going down. And that returns you, again, a single number, which can then square root. Or you can even expand it all out to y1 minus xm1 squared plus y2 minus xm2 squared, all the way up to yn minus xmn squared, and then square rooted. And you can see this is why we just use that notation for the norm of this, uh, the, the, the difference between uh, y and xm, because, it, well, if you do it on paper, it saves a lot of ink. Now, this is fine, Euclidean distance is fine, but it does ignore the correlation between variables, which is, which is quite important because it can misrepresent how close two firms are. So say you've got two um, firms which are uncorrelated and they're both the same distance from the center of whatever um, two variable measures you're using for closeness for, for, for these firms. So that orange dot there is the centroid, that the black dot is firm one, the grey dot is firm two. And you see that the Euclidean distance is the same, so they both might look as though they are the same. But if the measures that you're looking at for these two firms are highly correlated, it's fairly clear that although the grey dot, firm two, is consistent with all the other firms there, the black dot really isn't. So correlation, which isn't taken into account in Euclidean distance, could, could result in you making the wrong decision if you are using Euclidean distance to, um, to try to describe what's going on. You've also got um, the fact that it fails to distinguish between the scale of the variables. So say you've got um, the two variable case for um, firm M, where they're XM1 and XM2. If XM1 is much larger than XM2, there, so, so for all of the different firms. So say you've got um, one measure where the average is 1 and another measure where the average is 100. Changes in the thing where the average measure is 100 will dominate the distance calculation. It's a bit like having a right-angled triangle where one side is much, much bigger than the other. The, 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 the size of the hypotenuse is going to be dominated by what happens with that, that bigger size. So, so some sort of scaling is probably necessary to, to adjust Euclidean distance. Um, if you want to develop Euclidean distance, one thing that you could do is to try to stretch the 
observations that you've got. So move from something which is a um, elliptical distribution to a spherical distribution by, by scaling all the observations. And what you want to scale it by is the inverse of the variances and covariances. So take account of the um, volatilities and the correlations between the different variables and then just try to strip those out. And what you could do for this, a way that you could do this is to start with your um, calculation, your formula for the Euclidean distance, but in the middle stick an additional term which is the inverse of the um, covariance matrix for everything that you're looking at. So instead of having y minus xm uh, transpose times y minus xm, you have y minus xm transpose matrix multiplied by um, s minus 1, the inverse of that covariance matrix, multiplied by y minus xm. And then you take the square root of that. And what that does, it moves you from the Euclidean distance to the Mahalanobis distance. So the Mahalanobis distance is a kind of a standardised alternative to the Euclidean distance, which explicitly allows for the correlation between the variables you're looking at and different volatilities in the variables that you're looking at. So Mahalanobis distance is it's like Euclidean distance with each contributing distance scaled by the inverse of the covariance matrix of the training set, so the data that we're using to, to build our, our KNN approach. Um, so if you've got something which has a high covariance, um, either driven by the volatility or, or the correlation, then that dimension has a lower weight and the effective distance is, is smaller. And one way of looking at this is to, um, to consider a, a hypothetical example. So say you've got um, um, a small child and a large dog, and you're trying to see whether each of them belongs to the data set which you have of, of dogs. So you've got weight on the horizontal axis and height on the vertical axis. So if you look at the top left of those charts there, um, say you've got here an Irish wolfhound and an 18 month old child, which you know, you know, not that up on the height of either, but you know, let's say they're about the same height. So the black dot and the grey dot are about the same on the vertical axis. But an Irish wolfhound weighs an awful lot more than an 18 month child. So they're in quite different places on the um, horizontal axis. And all those other blue dots represent the weight and height combinations for all other breeds of dogs. Yeah. Hypothetically, this isn't real data. I don't have that data set to hand. Now you can see, if you're trying to see, you know, which one of these is a dog? Is the Irish wolfhound a dog? Is the small child a dog? Well, they're both the same distance from the center of that uh, distribution. So if you're just measuring distance from the center of the distribution, they both appear quite, quite dog-like. But if instead of using Euclidean distance, which is what the top left chart does, you use Mahalanobis distance, well, you then find that the small child is quite a long way from the centre of that distribution, whereas the Irish wolfhound is still relatively closer. And what I've done there, to calculate, I've calculated the Mahalanobis distance there by uh, looking at the inverse of the covariance matrix and plugging that into the middle of that Euclidean distance formula. And then I've worked out what the implications of using the uh, Mahalanobis distance would be on those coordinates. So you can see what I've essentially done is I've taken that um, fairly narrow set of data there, uh, that elliptical set of data, and I've turned it from being elliptical to spherical, stretching it out. And you can see that what that does is it pulls the data for the Irish wolfhound closer to the centre of that distribution, and it stretches the data for the child way out. And it makes it very clear that an Irish wolfhound is a dog, and an 18-month child is not a dog. So this is why Mahalanobis distance is um, a much more useful approach, I believe, when you're looking at KNN, to, rather than using the Euclidean distance. Because one thing you're certain of when you're doing KNN in terms of credit modelling is a lot of the stuff that you're looking at is going to be pretty highly correlated. So it is quite important to, to take that into account. So I'm going to leave it there for now. Um, that gives us the basis of everything that we're going to be doing around KNN and gives us 
a good insight into a lot of the considerations that we need to have when we're deciding how we are measuring distance. Because, because measuring distance is what's really fundamental in uh, K-nearest neighbor approach. So that should give us a good grounding for everything which is going to come after this.